And so it came to pass that these words spoke in wrath dispersed to all corners of the land, proclaiming their message and blasting all minds that heard it. Neighbor turned on neighbor, and in sudden fury fathers dragged sons onto the street and there murdered them. The gentle beasts of the field trampled one another, and herdsmen slew their cattle to bathe in their blood. The kings and princes of the land fell to fevered imaginings, adorning themselves with armor and weapons, and demanding a throne from the bones of their kin. Prisoners and slaves were put to the sword, their heads adorning the royal dais, and the kings sent their soldiers forth into the towns and villages to harvest more skulls for the skull thrones. Every living thing they killed, all that drew breath, was culled from the earth, which in turn was fired and the walls tumbled down so nothing there could live again. When the earth was made as mud and the lifeblood of innocents and wild creatures roamed the deserted lands drinking marrow from the bones of the dead, the kings and princes turned their armies outside their hollow kingdoms to wage war against each other. The armies of all the lands met in a valley blocked by four mountains to the north and four mountains to the south. And there they fell upon one another with every weapon, animal, and cunning machine they commanded. The battle raged long as fortune waxed and waned from one army to the next. For eight days and seven nights the warriors of the lands pushed and heaved and stabbed and slew. The kings released their hunting dogs that harried and bit and gorged themselves on hot flesh. Terrible horsemen on steeds clad in steel charged again and again and again. The death toll was so great that the valley itself filled with blood and drowned those who fought in its depths. The soldiers in battle hungered and consumed the fallen, drank their blood to quench their thirst, while the kings themselves ate only the flesh from the heads brought to them. As the sun sunk down into the lake of death for the eighth time, the battle faltered and stopped, for the bloodthirst that had driven each mortal soul forward had at last been sated. The armies could fight no more, and there came a great wailing from the valley, as every soldier lifted his voice and cried out for release, for victory, or for the strength to carry on. A multitude raised their shouts to a thousand empty gods. None replied, for the true god had heard his servants cry, and its answer was one of bloodlust, power, and awesome violence. From the boiling sea rose eight mighty creatures, each with the heads of dogs and the bodies of lions, and each one yoked with great chains of brass. They climbed forth each mountain, and behind them dragged upward a new mountain from the sea, a mountain of bone and skulls that reached fully ten times the height of the eight peaks around it. Upon its sight, the soldiers of the battle took new heart and rose again from the gore-drenched earth to praise their true lord, while the kings and princes threw themselves down in fear as they recognized the true skull throne, of which their own had been but palest imitations. Atop the very summit, the embryonic god screamed its name in a birth cry that echoed and crashed from peak to peak and drove the cowardly mad even as it strengthened the worthy beyond mortal effort. And the name was Karneth, our blood god, Corn. 
extract from the prescribed text Bound in Blood, author unknown, provenance unknown. Translation made possible by the deaths of 8th Transcriptus Adepts, date unknown. Corn is one of the four cardinal aspects of chaos. The archenemy, the primordial annihilator, the malevolent extra-universal force that dwells within the space outside of space we term the warp. The blood god is a self-aware hurricane of violence, torment, and brutality. The chaos aspect of warfare and bloodshed, the gullet into which is poured the sum total of the material universe's desires to inflict death and destruction. It exists within the clashing of blades, the firing of the bullets, the gleaming of murderous intent within the eyes of all sentient beings. Surrender to its infection, within the moment where rationality dissolves and consciousness crumbles in the face of rage, within those moments, the blood god finds purchase in the mortal mind. The song of his existence is the tramps of boots marching to war, the gasps of lungs pierced by blades, the splatter of blood upon earth. By the light of sanguine moons do its followers howl their mindless devotions as they rip and tear and rend and maim, tainting reality with malignant fury, spreading the thirsting laughter of this god thing throughout the void. As long as beings of the Materium seek each other's end, Karneth will dwell within the warp feeding upon the tumult of bloodletting intent, swelling in power with each death reaped. In aspect, he is oft depicted as a bestial monstrosity, cloven-hooved, helmed and armored in brass, atop a throne of skulls vast beyond possible comprehension, reputed to be constructed from the heads of all those its servants have killed in its name. Atavistic is he, the howl of the predator thing in the dark, the plunging of an axe towards a neck, titanic, eternal, inescapable. The primordial annihilator is self-aware, after a fashion. It is fundamentally a universal force, or rather extra-universal, aligned with paranormal energies of our own universe, linked somehow through emotions and ideas. The warp ebbs and flows, the dreams, hopes, fears, and nightmares of humanity, indeed most all sentient species, by the fundamental quirks of reality, for a reason beyond explanation in its monstrosity, the forces within the warp respond far, far more strongly to emotions that we would deem negative. Rage, desolation, desire, possibility. The things in the warp feed upon belief. It is their foodstuff, their total nourishment, that from which they swell with grotesque power in their hideous realms. We deem them intelligences, although they are far more akin to ideas with a motive force. There are four cardinal aspects around which the emotional tides of the immaterium bend, and those we have, by necessity, come to refer to as gods. Human language, be it Gothic, low or high, or any tongue spoken across our history, has proven insufficient in rendering a term precisely for what these things are, for they defy explanation in any conventional capacity. Gods is a term fitting only to grasp the possibilities of their power and influence. I myself prefer the term greater intelligence, as given all that one has read upon the powers of words and faith in this universe, I believe that to continue to term these things gods only increases their potential. Nevertheless, one is forced to admit that the term is a necessary one. Only the emperor himself is a being in power as divine as those the archenemy can wield. The four greater intelligences draw onto them as much power as they can. They are formed and informed by us and our actions, and seek to influence us in kind. 
Karnath is one such, vying for purchase in this universe as his dread siblings seek the same. Eternally in competition, acting in unison, simultaneously opposed, brothers, siblings. Chaotic. Scholars of damnation have debated long and intensely, often prior to their untimely deaths, as to the origins of this particular aspect of annihilation. While chronology in its truest sense has simply no grip upon the warp, the greater intelligences and their multifarious emanations exist outside of time itself, it is broadly acknowledged that all warp entities are given birth through acts within the material universe. The cardinal aspects are thus posited to have been born of acts just as fundamental. Perhaps, in the first moment, an early, barely evolved sentient stove in another skull with a stone tool for a purpose other than simply consuming, the blood god was born. Conflict is universal. The sources of it just staggering in number. A carefully planned murder for political gain or a berserk warrior committing wanton slaughter upon civilians. Differing in almost every aspect though they may be, death is the ultimate result. And that death is power to the warp. The old adage of the mighty overcoming the weak, blinkered as it may be, underpins much of the universe. Survival bought at the expense of the other. Such fundamentality is the fuel that lit the pyre that became the inferno that the damned call corn. The endless warfare that now defines our galaxy with its skulls and blood are all this being appears to require. No syrupy words of devotion for the skull throne merely acts as base and brutal as can be managed. Of course, there are levels to this, as with all things concerning the primordial annihilator. The blood god is bloodshed taken to extremis, thus the greater the slaughter, the more its power swells. The mightiest of wars are what this thing seeks, for again chaos will ever seek to push the mortal realm towards the extreme, glutting itself on the feast of energies that lie at the end of all things. Karnath could not possibly be content with bar fights or lone spiteful murders. These may find their way to its throne, of course, but the hunger of an intelligence as vast as it will forever seek more. Eternal war, never-ending bloodshed, the ceaseless, constant flow of vitae across a million, billion worlds. Such would be this god-thing's paradise. It is a morose testament to this galaxy that, despite the ultimate contradiction of its goals, there will always be more humans to feed to the Malachian hunger of this intelligence, forever more meat churned and pulped and sifted to the grinder of war. Followers of the Blood God, for all the single-mindedness that typically defines them, do not arise from singular origins. For all that imperial propagandists wish to define the Bloody One's warriors, as simple-minded barbarians, and for all the most visible certainly often embody this archetype, the tendrils of Karneth work their way into the hearts of every warrior, every soldier, every law-keeper, every soul that has ever taken a life or desired within themselves to do so. As with all the greater intelligences of the primordial annihilator, the path of devotion its followers thread can be short or winding, all depending on the choices made along it. Should an individual forget for why they let the blood of their foes, well, the damnation will come all more rapidly. Righteousness is no surefire means of security. Violence begets violence, and who amongst us is able to discern when such acts are just or monstrous? It is within these ambiguities that Cahorn lies, the descent of a warrior from noble to base, selfless to selfish, that is the sweetest prize. For as unsubtle a being as he, the path to its brazen throne is remarkably occluded, or at least its beginnings are. This is not to say the blood god only prefers the usurped, the unwillingly corrupted. Far from it. 
those for whom sadistic barbarity is a way of life, a natural inclination, or simple sick pleasure, find a ready patron. Those with the purpose to, and the ambition to indulge in, wanton, heinous bloodletting are prized devotees, not least to those who have overcome the constraints of cultures, societies, or families to spill precious vitae. They have thrown off the chains of decency, empathy, and humanity to revel in unspeakable violence, only to find themselves leashed to an altogether different master. To gain the favor of their crimson deity, the willing followers of the blood god must simply spill the blood of other sentient beings in its name. They will seek proactively to find conflict, engaging foes in battles designed to either prove their own might or to cause as many casualties as can be wrought possible. While the criteria varies, it is a common thread that the followers of Karneth believe that their foe must be a worthy one, a challenge to overcome, to prove not only their own martial prowess, but their fervor and desire to survive and triumph. This is not always the case, as the maxim of many thrall of the archenemy that corn cares not from whence the blood flows. This is readily taken quite literally. Genocidal wars of extermination are engaged in just as readily as contests of honorable combat. Populations of entire worlds are offered to the base of the Skull Throne in osseous abasement. Devotees believe the favor of their infernal patron blesses them with gifts, and indeed the material boons of the Lord of Brass typically take the form of swollen muscles, tougher skin, faster reaction times, even bladed protrusions from bodies, anything that may give a champion of the Annihilator an edge upon the field of battle. A fascination with and a fixation upon skulls has been observed across years immemorial and distances galactic. The lords of the warp are obsessed with fundamental symbolism. And what is a more pure symbol of death than the skull? The blood god sits atop a throne of them, and unto this horde its followers are expected to add. The addition is metaphorical, after a fashion, but many a devotee will festoon their personage with the craniums of dispatched foes, the clanking and clattering of bones forming an underbeat to the tempo of their violence. Many scoff at the sheer impossibility of a cult dedicated to the worship of this particular intelligence operating in any sort of clandestine form. But like as not, they grow silent in exposure to the truth of things. As one discussed earlier, the means of violence are not always overt. Blood may flow silently, and yet still pool at the base of that throne. Many an Inquisitor or Arbitez officer have uncovered secret lodges dedicated to combat of an altogether corruptive form, or broken upon the practices of a fraternity letting blood in debased ceremonial sacrifices. While in large part the followers of the blood god scorn the wielding of arts, psychic and arcane, this does not preclude Cahorn from patronizing those who many would define as priests. Holy men, for want of better terms, loci of ritualized worship of he upon the skull throne. The Lord Invocatus of the World Eater's Heretic Astartes Band, for example, is just so, an individual who has achieved a form of stability within the hurricane of blood-blind insanity that defines that particular legion, devoting the bloodletting he leads his warriors on to the warp with a clarity that is almost more abominable than the frothing lunacy of his charges. While the intelligence itself may view the concept of Psychana as abominable, the organization, through a debased spirituality of violence, is not. Similarly, shrines to such worship are also common, ranging in size and complexity from a simple stone altar bedecked with ancient dried blood to a cathedral of industrial slaughter on a planet wholly accursed and consumed by the immaterial. Given, however, that the worship Korn desires most lies in active combat, his church is more often than not the battlefield itself, 
Markers like those mentioned dedicated to the memories of a conflict. The Blood God cares not for monument or edifice, only the acts taken place upon or within them. The grandeur of a cathedral is for the mortal. The beheadings, the blood, that is for the brazen lord. It is reality, however, that the most favored and damned of the Blood God's servants are his berserks, those to whom life, existence, is merely a spectrum of red. The devolution to this state is reserved for the most devout. In the insane whirl of combat they dwell, fueled by an impossible thirst for the shedding of blood that can never be sated. They are fonts for the grotesque motive force that flows from the skull throne, subsumed to the warp-driven need to kill and slaughter. Such a state can consume any who pledge their existence to the blood god, from the lowliest dregs of humanity to the pinnacle of our genetic engineering, for the most famous of these berserks are, of course, fallen Astartes. The first so damned are the aforementioned World Eaters, whose downfall to barbarity during the days of the Horus Heresy is a tale reserved for other records. In the ten thousand years since, far too many more Astartes have either been raised to or brought within this legion's fold, or have simply descended to becoming foul renegade bands enthralled to the Skull Throne themselves. Many have wondered if such a thing were an inevitability. The greater intelligence bent towards corrupting the martial struggle, ensnaring within his grasp humanity's greater warriors. The eaters of worlds are truly fallen, as like to turn upon friend as they are foe, for once again, the Blood God cares not from whence the blood flows. There is often little to distinguish a fallen renegade from an original legionary. Indeed, few of these individuals would ever even be concerned with such distinctions. The world eaters rarely group in any cohesive force, fractured millennia hence by some terrible event. The bellicosity that consumes them allows for little nuance or patience for intricacies such as alignments or alliances. While few berserks of the Blood God are permanently in a state of frenzy, their lack of patience is phenomenal, and their periods of true lucidity quite few, growing more infrequent as their years pass and their kill counts increase. Charting their destiny in a galaxy typified by endless warfare is hideously easy for being driven to do naught but kill. The fallen hordes beholden to Karneth are incredibly vicious foes. Mercy is an alien concept, for to grant it is to fundamentally deny your role within and view of the universe. They possess a singular drive, and will stop at nothing to achieve it. I understand them not, but I fear them immeasurably. One has learned much in attempting to navigate the knowledge damnable. Should depths be plumbed too greedily and too deeply? Should actual understanding be sought? Madness has gripped me before, and my triumph over it has been bitter and dearly bought. Frustrating though it may be, the greater intelligence of the warp are oft best explored in terms poetic. They are concepts and in attempting their refinement, their eyes are drawn upon you. The following passage is extracted from a source unknown. It is perhaps prophecy. It could simply be the ravings of the mad. But within it are couched concepts through which the entity we have explored may, possibly, be further comprehended, and damnation staved off for another day. Gird thyself. Clutch your faith in him closer. The Emperor protects. He must. And after all this was done, I looked out upon the world and saw it in shadow. I looked to the sun, and eclipsing my view stood the mountain. And I knew the last days were upon us all. I raised my eyes to its peak, and there stood a man. 
The man held his arms aloft against the light, and from them issued forth the deepest shadow, the size of which would cover all the lands and plunge them into unnatural darkness. And as the darkness touched me, I knew this be the blood god Corn, come to take his final toll. He leaped into the air, and with him detached the shadow from the earth, and I saw these shades were his wings by which he would sweep away the nations of the world. Behind him followed eight creatures, each with faces that looked in every direction. I peered upon them and knew them to be the eight princes of blood, and their names were Baroria, Philitar, Quintaril, Nithrendril, Ishardir, Yotdres, Dactlau, and Gazdentain. And the blood god did travel to the island to the north of the great raised continent and did visit the altar in his name. And there he placed his hand upon the sword in place and did reclaim the eternal blade for the end times were now upon us all. And the blood god did stand before the first creature which was of iron and lead, which had four legs and four eyes, and who did walk with the roll of thunder, and did bear upon his brow the mark of corn inscribed in a seal of black iron. And this first creature did bow before his master, and the blood god did raise his sword and strike the head off this first creature from its body. And when the head fell to the ground and the world did quake and tremble as it had never done before, the walls and buildings of every town and every city fell to the ground and mighty towers of mortal nations collapsed upon themselves. No fortress stood, nor no other structure was left standing, and the wild things did enter the towns and cities and savage the people cowering therein, for there was no defense to keep them away. Thus the world was leveled and saw it returned to savagery. And the blood god did stand before the second creature, which was a bull of fire and flowing metal, which had four legs and four legs more, and a gaze of fire that scorched whatever its gaze fell upon. And the second creature did bow before its master. And the blood god did raise his sword and struck the head off the second creature from its body. And as the blade cleaved through its neck, there blossomed a pillar of fire that reached up high above the world and dove down to bore into its heart. Upon each hill and mountain in the world was consumed a flame that shattered their peaks and threw them into the air to fall upon the peoples fleeing their hidden homes. Thus none could hide from the final wrath. And the blood god did stand before the third creature that was a faceless steed of grey and white dust whose body did ebb and flow and gradually reformed with the winds that forever carried it apart. And this third creature did bow before its master, and the lord of blood did raise his sword and strike the head off this third creature from its body. And as the sword blade struck, the steed did disappear upon the winds and was carried across the lands of the world. Wherever the dust of its body touched, the fertile earth became as dead ash, upon which no life could ever bloom. Thus there could be no more new life of that basest kind that supports all others. And the blood god did stand before the fourth creature that was a formless, being of flowing flesh and pulsating veins whose body rippled and pulsed with every beat of its heart. And this fourth creature did bow before its master as best it could, and the blood god did raise his sword and strike off the foremost portion of this fourth creature from its body. And from the gaping wound that was left there came a deluge of blood, a crimson flood to cover the earth with its death, and from the mountain too came a torrent of skulls, crying bloody tears, and bones split and bled their marrow down into the world. All the waters of the world became as blood, and the seas turned red, and the wells were fouled, and the rivers and streams clogged and flooded with the hardening flow. Thus those that fled his wrath would pant until death 
for refreshment and always be denied. And the blood god did stand before the fifth creature that was a collared beast hideous in appearance with limbs and teeth and skin and eyes that could not be glanced upon for fear of running mad with the terror of its mere sight. And the fifth creature did bow down before his master, and the blood god did raise his sword and strike off the head of this fifth creature from its body. And the sword struck the collar and broke it in two. There was released a mighty force that flew to the raised continent and smashed the spells of confinement asunder. Thereupon every mage and sorcerer did not bear the mark, fell dead where they stood. Thus never more would the undeniable chaos be imprisoned. And the blood god did stand before the sixth creature, which was of impenetrable darkness, upon which no detail nor feature could be deciphered. And this sixth creature did bow before his master, and the blood god did raise his sword and strike off the head of this sixth creature from its body. And as the sword passed through the darkness, the forces containing it fell apart, and the darkness bled, pouring forth itself across the world before draining deep down into the poisoned earth. As it passed under me, I felt a chill so total that I realized this was the shadow riding forth, making our realm as that of others, and fit thereby for its unholy denizens. Thus our two realms became one, and demons walked free. And the blood god did stand before the seventh creature, which was of hollow frame and featureless skin, lest an enlarged oval mouth. And this seventh creature did bow down before his master, and the blood god did raise his sword and struck off the head of this seventh creature from its body. And once the blow had been struck, there came a roaring gale that ran through the creature's body and produced a howling call that sounded in every heart and head. There then marched in response every demon of his faith, every mortal to his name devoted. Then the call resounded and struck back at the mountain, and the mountain's very slopes began to raise as the dead of Korn's loyal followers and their victims across all time and creation rose as one and joined the serried ranks of this, his supreme horde, with which he would conquer all existence. And the peoples of the world did groan at such a sight, for there stood for every one of their warriors countless numbers of this foe. Their destruction was inevitable. It was ordained. Even as they realized this, I saw their armies join as one, eager now that they had an opponent they could face, march forth against a horde to bring them to one final battle. But the Lord of Blood did stand before the eighth creature, which had been crouched and curled and so obscured in its form. Now he stood plain, and I saw that he and his god, he stood before, were identical so that none could tell them apart. The creature and the lord of blood took one another by the head and soared into the air until one could not be distinguished from the other. And then one did gain the victory, and took up the sword from the fallen, and struck the head from the other. And the armies of the world stood where they had watched, and slowly their weapons and banners dropped from their hands, and all rage and courage and thoughts of war fled from their bodies, and they cowered and ran from the battlefield. And the gods, the dead, the living and the demonic of the horde did turn upon one another with such will and savagery that the slaughter of the multitude did only last until the sun was hidden behind the mountain, before they were all of them destroyed. Blood for the blood god. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash oculusimperia. 
If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.